It's a great it's, pleasure. You know, <laughs> we're we very excited to hear your your talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, well, it's I'm excited to hear it too. <laughs> it's been a very long time that we've been involved in the San Francisco waterfront. Many, many, many different jobs, many, many different years. Long, long sure. period. It's a long period. Absolutely. So we're, we're going to, I think, Richard, go a little beyond what you had. We're going to talk a little bit more broadly about the San Francisco waterfront and the changes that have been experienced that we were a part of beyond uh, just the uh, downtown um, uh, ferry building area. Right. But we think that all of it has relevance for uh, architecture students who are thinking urbanistically about places. So I think there's lessons in all of it. That's wonderful. Uh, Mary Beth, whenever you think we should uh, we should yeah. start, just let me know. We can get started. Stephanus, did you want to say something before Richard does the introduction? Yeah, I can. Shall I? Sure. OK, please. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Stephanos Polizoides, Dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Notre Dame. And it's my great pleasure to introduce Bonnie Fisher and Boris Dramov to you today. Uh, the introduction is coming, the specific introduction is coming by Richard Egonomakis in a moment, but I would like to welcome uh, them and, and um, just tell you simply in one sentence that they're some of the most important living uh, uh, urban designers in the country and friends going back 20, 30 years um, with a, an extraordinary portfolio and really relevant work, particularly in the area of of uh, generating cities that are livable and and uh, compact and diverse and and extraordinary as only they can uh, both do and um, and tell you about. So it is with great pleasure that I'm turning the introduction over to uh, to Richard. Thank you, Morris uh, yeah. and Bonnie, for being with us today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Till soon. Well, um, welcome to all who are attending tonight's lecture by uh, Boris Dramov and Bonnie Fisher. I, I say tonight, but uh, of course, uh, I'm reminded that in California, uh, where uh, our guests are zooming in from, it's only just an hour or so after lunchtime, I think. Uh, so thank you so much for taking time out of your busy day. Um, it's a great pleasure to host you. It, it would, of course, be so much nicer if you could be here with us in person, and, and so we hope that uh, you can visit here sometime in the near future. I uh, would like to say just a few words of introduction. Mr. Dramoff and Ms. Fisher are principals of the Roma Design Group, which was founded in San Francisco in 1968. Since becoming principals in 1980, the firm has come to be known especially for revitalizing declining urban districts. As the firm's design principal, Mr. Dramoff has been focused on projects that address critical issues of environmental quality and social equity in towns, cities, and regions. He was responsible for establishing Roma's reputation for excellence in the design of public spaces, working for nearly two decades in the Santa Monica downtown and civic center areas, beginning with the Third Street Promenade, which is today one of the most successful pedestrian places in Southern California. He's also played an important role in the transformation of San Francisco's urban waterfront after the demolition of the Embarcadero Freeway and revitalization of the new ferry terminal and the creation of the necklace of parks, promenades, plazas, piers, and other public spaces that have brought a new identity, recreational activity, and transit accessibility to that part of the city. In 2000, Mr. Dramoff le led Roma's efforts in the design of the Martin Luther King Jr. National Memorial in Washington, DC, which was selected as the winning submission in an architectural design competition. As landscape principal, Ms. Fisher has been involved in projects ranging in scale from the planning of new urban districts to the design and implementation of urban open spaces, including the Martin Luther King National Memorial. She's played a key role in virtually every project that Roma has undertaken, from the planning and design of the San Francisco waterfront to the reshaping of Santa Monica's downtown. Before I conclude, I, I'd like to say that it's been our honor to feature the work of Mr. Dramoff and Ms. Fisher in our school's inaugural issue of the journal ANTA, which will shortly be heading to the printers. The focus of the article is on their interventions along the San Francisco waterfront, in particular, the revitalization of the area 
along the demolished Embarcadero Freeway and the old ferry building. Uh, we hope to be able to share the publication with you in just a few weeks time. We're looking forward very much to your talk tonight. Please join me in welcoming uh, Boris Stramoff and Bonnie Fisher. Well, thank, thank you. you for inviting us to uh, uh, you know, this lecture series and to the efforts of the publication that you're about to release. Um, we're gonna, you know, we like a very casual dialogue. So certainly, you know, questions and answers at the end of the presentations are extremely welcome and com any comments uh, that might be made. Um, let me go back and just, uh, you know, tell you that we're gonna use the San Francisco story as examples of urbanism uh, and the approaches that we have taken. And um, we, it's a fairly broad story, but I think it would be interesting to the students and faculty of what happened here. Uh, and it gives a lot of lessons for what uh, urbanism uh, has addressed and how it can address in the future. Let's go to the first one. Um, um, Okay, is that for, oh, sorry. Um, okay, there are many approaches to uh, urbanism that can be taken, but we have focused a lot of our work on, uh, the, on the revitalization of underutilized pieces of cities. And we've done that because of the importance that this resource of urban land has to play but also because it's an opportunity to knit back together portions of the city in a more meaningful and attractive place uh, for uh, new uh, places to live and work in the city. Uh, so uh, this has been where we have focused a lot of our effort. Go ahead, the Bonnie. images that are shown here, uh, just to give you a sense, are uh, some of the projects that we've worked on, and obviously the, these are the before pictures. <laughs> um, this is uh, Portland waterfront. This is a portion of the San Francisco waterfront that we are not going to be talking about tonight, but it's even further south fr from what we will be talking about. And then these two images down at the bottom are of the Oakland estuary, but we've been working on waterfront projects all around the world from Vancouver and Cole Harbor, British Columbia to Auckland, New Zealand, um, and all across the United States. So it has come out of this interest in, in, uh, that we've had for very many years in recycling and uh, revitalization of areas that were in decline in the city. Should I go to the next slide? Uh, well, no, no, not yet. Uh, uh, you know, because the waterfront is such a malleable part of, of uh, cities, uh, it's created some of the most significant opportunities for transformation uh, with you know, significant changes in industry and in transportation, the opportunity for, this, uh, for areas to be adaptively reused uh, for new urban uses is really been one of the primary areas. The waterfront is a malleable portion of cities in a lot of cases and has been transformed many times throughout uh, their history. Uh, we do feel that understanding history is an important part of the evolution of place, but we don't look to, uh, you know, nostalgically recreate that, but really to inform us about how it, how an area has evolved and uh, would change. We can go to the next one. I'm just gonna talk a little bit about uh, the San Francisco waterfront. It, San Francisco is a place that has been strongly connected over its history to the waterfront. And there is no place in the city that more represents or gives material expression to that 
than the uh, ferry building, which is at the foot of Market Street um, and centrally located in the middle of the downtown waterfront. We'll be talking more about the ferry building and its transformation over time uh, as the uh, presentation unfolds. But I wanted to just point out, even though the slide says the ferry building in 1927. It was built in the 1880s as part of building the Great Seawall, which today, if you look at the city shoreline, the huge sweep that we have of um, the edge on the eastern side of the city comes from uh, the Great Seawall being built and then stopping the era of tremendous filling of shallow waters to get out to very deep uh, offshore port lands that could be used as a place where uh, ships could come in and trade could commence. Uh, the ferry building itself is an extremely important landmark. It occupies a length which is longer than most city blocks. It's 660 feet long. So it really created a strong sense of this is the place. This is the most important place in the city. And this is what it's it the means gateway. to us. It was the gateway to the city. The gateway to the city in many ways for all the ferries that came in and out. And then connecting by transit, as you can see down at the bottom of the image, up Market Street uh, to the rest of the city as it was developing. But in the, in the years following World War II, there were a lot of changes that occurred that had very big impacts on the waterfront, its uh, sense of economic activity, and its, um, uh, its importance as an employment set place and as a place of, of overall activity to the city of San Francisco. Um, the period of time where break ball cargo had been really what sustained the port uh, was the reason for the being of the finger piers in terms of shipping technology, gave way to the advent of containerization. Uh, trucks and cars began to be built uh, or the facilities for them began to be built. And there was a huge change in, in time. The ferries after the construction of the Bay Bridges in the 50s and 60s uh, actually went from uh, a period of great activity to significant decline before the uh, before World War II, and in the early 1900s, the ferry building had been the second major transportation terminal in the world, second to Charing Cross uh, Terminal in London. And after the construction of the Bay Bridges, the uh, the entire ferry service stopped for a period of time. And as a result of all of that, when the area began to decline in activity, it began to be seen as a place that was a, an expedient, uh, easy choice for the location of all kinds of service facilities that then looked to be needed for the city of San Francisco and actually for everywhere. Uh, but, you know, a lot of it had to do with the change from the kind of finger pier technology that was very prevalent when break bulk cargo existed. And really, the, you know, San Francisco's development was very much tied to having the deep water port. But later on, when the rail connection and containerization occurred, Oakland side picked it up because it was not on the peninsula and therefore could have the direct rail connections that were very important for the uh, shipment, uh, transshipment from the harbor inland. Uh, At the time, the waterfront really shifted from a place that was a place in itself to a place of through movement. So from through movement, its emphasis shifted and it became a place that in the 1950s was designated along the waterfront in this location was in fact the location for the Embarcadero Freeway, uh, it connecting then across to the, to the Bay Bridge. 
and it was intended to extend all the way along the waterfront to the Golden Gate Bridge. Yes, yeah, so you can see here is the Bay Bridge. This was the 1950s traffic wave plans for, um, for San Francisco. And I, I would imagine that many cities had very, uh, at the time, optimistic hopes for building in infrastructure like this and creating a, a new place of um, activity and commerce based on the, the automobile and movement. But in San Francisco's case, it was clearly part of a through movement scheme that would connect the Bay Bridge all the way along the waterfront to the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, luckily, this was stopped by uh, community protest uh, San Francisco is noted for having uh, one of the earliest, the first uh, public protest against freeways and actually managed to stop it. So looking back for a second at this image of the Embarcadero Freeway, you can see that it actually stopped at Broadway, um, never was completed. And it was really in many ways a long off ramp rather than a freeway, but something that ultimately was a part of this movement, which was to stop all freeways altogether. Uh, you know, the activism that developed to stop the freeway construction throughout, uh, in fact, Golden Gate Park and, and along the waterfront also led to uh, uh, the, it, you know, a concern for the residential neighborhoods of the city and for construction that would block views. And this, the uh, slide in the lower right uh, shows the Fontana Towers, which was always depicted as one of the real catalysts for uh, downzoning all of the residential areas to 40 feet in the city and to really focusing on the preservation of the existing neighborhoods that people love. But at the same time, the downtown area, the slide, the portion of the slide on the left was growing significantly as an office center. And I think one of the real questions in the city as a whole was how do we balance where residential development would go when we're having such a significant office development, but the existing residential areas have been really down zone and in fact uh, with uh, emphasis on preservation. Uh, you, you know, this controversy was an important part of the considerations in the city. And then people looked at the waterfront as a potential, uh, not only to meet uh, new residential opportunities, but because it needed to be addressed in a comprehensive planning way uh, for what should happen to these underutilized pieces of land and that we're no longer serving the shipping requirements of uh, uh, you know, downloading the cargo and warehousing and so on, uh, and also uh, the transportation needs of the city. Next one. Uh, in about uh, 1970, the city decided to undertake uh, a comprehensive plan of the downtown waterfront, the Northeast Waterfront Plan. Uh, and it created, uh, it brought together all of the intergovernmental agencies, uh, which had some jurisdiction over what was happening, but had really not worked together with the Citizens Advisory Committee uh, structured a comprehensive planning process. And we were fortunate to be the consultants for this process, which really began to look at the way in which the waterfront needed to be transformed uh, to meet the demands of the city uh, and doing it in a way that did not uh, endanger the preservation of the residential portions of the city uh, as well. And just to add uh, one thing, this was an, a time of great upheaval and, uh, and settlement in the city of San Francisco. Uh, there had been years, decades of controversy, major controversy over what should happen on the waterfront. There had been proposals around the ferry building to get rid of the ferry building and the tower altogether and build high rises offshore. 
There had been uh, high rise development proposed along the entire shoreline, but also in the background at the same time was quite a bit of governmental upheaval. Uh, George Moscone, our mayor at the time had been shot uh, and Diane Feinstein stepped in as mayor. And as mayor, she really did help lead quite a bit of the effort and a lot of the interests of bringing together and creating a consensus where none had ever existed. And I think at the time, nobody ever thought there could be a consensus that could ever be reached for what should happen on the urban waterfront. Let's take a look at a portion of the waterfront. And this is called the South Beach area, which is the portion of land south of the Bay Bridge, uh, which was considered uh, really obsolete for any of the warehousing and shipping uses. And it was looked at as a key opportunity for residential development close into downtown. So the, the designation of this area for a new residential community uh, with served by transit, which would be extended from Market Street, come out from under Market Street on the Embarcadero, and then connect to this portion of the city, and then ultimately extend it even further than that. But uh, so that was a, a new approach uh, that was taken. One of the things that had to happen right away, speaking of these transportation facilities, was the red lines on this map were, were areas that uh, the State Department of Highways had designated for extension of freeways to connect to the Embarcadero Freeway, and in fact had even begun purchasing property along this line. So the first step in coming up with this plan was demapping all of the freeway right of ways. And in some cases, utilizing the, the land that had been purchased as part of the redevelopment of, that, of the area. Okay, just a little bit of a before and after of the South Beach area. This is the way it looked at it before, re, you know, the redevelopment of, and this is the way it looks like today. So really bringing in the significant amount of higher density residential with a mix of market rate and affordable housing right close to downtown. And, and the role of, uh, you go ahead, Bonnie. I was just gonna say that the, the uh, overall percentage of affordable housing is very high somewhere. I mean, especially high as a goal in this period of time at around 35 to 40%. There are several thousand uh, residential units and the densities you know, range upwards of 80 BUs per acre. So all of these uh, ideas uh, of trying to balance uh, working places with, um, uh, with living places and creating uh, more equitable opportunities for the entire population uh, as well as higher density housing were, were embedded strongly into this plan. Uh, you know, one of the things about, you know, this redevelopment, which was very interesting is there was a lot of reaction to uh, uh, the redevelopment approach of clearance of existing areas and then, you know, building new development. But this is an area where there was really only warehousing and uh, leftover facilities uh, from, for transportation and shipping that were no longer needed and were obsolete. And so bringing in new development here was a uh, real opportunity without disrupting and the preservation of those highly desirable residential areas. But it was also created in a public-private partnership. It could not be developed totally without the kind of infrastructure improvements that were needed uh, uh, for the Embarcadero, the extension of the light rail transit, the building of parks and open spaces and so on. Uh, there was no land acquisition here, but the land that was previously set aside for freeway construction was then transferred to the city so it could be used for the development as well. So. Uh, it, this was uh, all built uh, with residential developers on the private lands and the public land. And really the major role of the public here 
was to build the infrastructure portion of it. Another example of the before, uh, this was at the stub of the I-280, uh, which was then removed and the connection from I-280 was really put on a boulevard along the King Street right of way uh, to connect to the, to the Embarcadero. Next one. And this is what it looks like today, making that connection. So all of this residential development along the new boulevard, as well as the ballpark, uh, came into this area on lands that were previously set aside for construction of more freeways, and in some cases also on port lands uh, right on the waterfront. So the result of this area was a new step in the direction of the city. Uh, that new residential development could be built close into downtown uh, without disturbing the existing residential neighborhoods. Next one. It also set a, a, a direction for growth in the city. City building in San Francisco has now focused a lot of its energies southward from this area. This is the new uh, University of California Medical Center which also went in on these uh, underutilized lands south of this area, uh, connecting along Third Street, which is really the main street uh, in the project. So the goal of recycling urban land along the waterfront, all of the reddish colored areas were either industrial warehousing or military areas uh, that could be used for new residential and commercial development uh, and institutional development like the medical center uh, along this portion of the waterfront, which is really a way in which city building could occur while preserving the existing character and quality of the city as a whole. Now the Embarcadero Freeway, uh, turning more to the north, uh, was something that had been anticipated, its removal had been anticipated and planned for as part of the Northeastern Waterfront Plan that we assisted the city in, in developing. Uh, and we had laid out the idea of a uh, recreational transit oriented boulevard that would extend all the way along the waterfront, the Embarcadero and would link parks and open space areas along the shoreline. Um, somewhat similar of an idea that has been historically uh, used many times uh, over the years and in the United States in the emerald necklace that Frederick Law Olmsted put together in, in Boston. But here along the waterfront, uh, it could not be uh, realized. There was a lot of support at the Board of Supervisors level for the, the project, but the idea that within a, a, a span of only 20 years, you could uh, demolish an investment that was very huge uh, along the waterfront uh, and replace it with other kinds of transportation improvements, I think was outside of the scope of the city. Well, there were a lot of real estate interests that wanted to keep it. However, the Loma Prieta earthquake created a whole different picture. And then once the freeway had been damaged to a point where it was not seismically safe anymore, then the decision was made to remove it. And, uh, and that's the way it proceeded. One of the first steps, however, in the consideration of removal, and this is a broader one, before we get into the physical design is that the Caltrans agreed to remove the freeway, that is the state highway board. Uh, however, it wanted the capacity that was provided by the freeway to be replaced. And it, there were just, we spent a great deal of time looking at schemes of how you could connect the Bay Bridge to the Embarcadero itself and then uh, deliver all of that traffic along a surface roadway. It, ultimately, it took some time to consider, but the way in which the 
traffic could be more effectively utilized the grid of the city to distribute traffic all the way to the downtown in many different places. And then you utilize the Embarcadero more as a multimodal boulevard with transit, historic rail cars also, and with pedestrians and bicycles be, finally took shape. And the idea of bringing all that traffic back down to the Embarcadero uh, was uh, uh, you know, removed. It was interesting that uh, when the freeway was on, however, it revealed this very large scale space that was left over uh, where it, it occupied the freeway. You can see the slide on the left uh, below with the freeway and the slide on the right when the freeway is gone, still creating a very large space that needed to figure out how to connect the city side which now became the connection between two significant periods of time, the early 19th century and the 20th century had to meet across this vast area. So there were a lot of questions about how that ha happened. And then th the idea of the physical design really started to develop. I think that also one of the things that you begin to realize is when something as big and as huge as a as a freeway gets removed, it's not just the freeway, which is the barrier. Of course, that's the central one and that's what makes everything else happen. But there were a series of barriers. There were a series of approaches that really reinforced that barrier effect of the waterfront. Uh, but for us, when it was finally removed and we had been thinking about the Embarcadero, thinking about the ferry building for many years, I think we were as surprised if not more so by others in terms of the scale that actually was occupied. I'm, we're gonna show you a couple of before and after shots uh, for the, um, of, you know, obviously the freeway with the ferry building. And then the next one is what we helped the city design and implement for a plaza area and the city side of the uh, uh, ferry building. What I wanted to just point here in this image is when I was talking about the layers of barrier, you see cars parked here, cars parked under the freeway, cars parked behind the freeway, and then really a barrier landscape that's trying to turn away from the waterfront. So when we began work on this Embarcadero project, it was not about the scaling and the rescaling of the area, but it was also about how do you remove all of those incidental approaches that have been taken from the face of the ferry building all the way to the face of the buildings in downtown to try to create a redirection towards the waterfront. Even the grade of the city, uh, when Larry Halpern had designed the Justin Herman Plaza, basically on the other side of the Embarcadero, the entire moves were towards grading backwards away from the waterfront. Turning your back to really the waterfront and screening, but no, sorry, uh, let's don't change it yet. Um, you know, let me just say one thing. When we were working on the project, there was a lot of interest about different ways to bring the traffic and the idea of a central plaza or a central open space uh, that recognized the ferry building. There was a lot of controversy about, should we go underground? Should we take the roadway to one side or should we split the roadway? And um, there were also a lot of opinions about what would make a better people oriented space. Uh, the idea of going below and then coming back up was very difficult with BART uh, two, which is the transit system in San Francisco, which goes across the bay and the tube goes right in this area. The idea of connecting the space to the ferry building and putting all the traffic in on the one side was really represented from the notion that uh, yes, it is probably harder to cross the double roadway that is north and southbound roadway on one side uh, but at the same time, it would create a better connection to activities with the building. 
Ultimately, for a whole lot of reasons, the opinion was that a split roadway, which was easier to cross for people to go from the city side over to the bay, was the better way to go, and which left the plaza area between uh, the north and the southbound lanes. And this is what resulted. But we put the transit stop right in the middle of the plaza as a way of activating the space and really um, making it more interesting that way. Just another before and after looking the other way of uh, the uh, uh, before with the freeway and the, the Justin Herman Plaza that Bonnie referred to that had been designed by Larry Halprin, but at the same time was really intentionally trying to screen from the freeway, which inadvertently also separated it from the waterfront. Okay, so in coming up with that idea though, it was not enough to build a new plaza area within the roadway, but a lot of the edges in particular of the open space that had been designed had to be reconfigured. So on the left, you can see the kind of uh, seawall uh, uh, notion that had been implemented, but again, large landscaping screening from the Embarcadero Freeway uh, and um, uh, that edge had to be really reconceived as well. Literally, as you can see in this one picture on the bottom left, uh, in the, on the seat wall, literally turning your back to the waterfront. So as part of the improvements, that edge had to be reconsidered. The connection from Market Street was made, uh, and you see that in the upper left uh, slide, uh, and uh, ways in which the promenade on the city side could be uh, improved and the edges transformed. So instead of being, uh, they became a seam between two environments rather than uh, uh, something that creates a, a termination or a barrier to the area. Uh, on the bay side though, also, uh, the with during the era that the freeway was there, it became the place to put the boiler for the ferry building and and really the service uses, and then those had to be uh, uh, reorganized as well. And next one, so that's the before and the after, as it became a bayside promenade, and all of the promenades in the area and connections had to be redesigned and rebuilt. Now, interestingly, looking at this picture, uh, it, 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 this was taken a while ago and we continue to work in the ferry building area, but what had happened was that we had provided for an arcade moving space uh, under the ferry building that would connect to the ferry terminals, which we'll talk about in a second. But, mm -hmm. but as the ferry building opened and became extremely attractive, that, area under the arcade became used for outdoor cafes and all kinds of attendant activities to the indoor ones right adjacent. And there became a push completely in the opposite direction of what I was talking about with the series of barriers, but now a push towards a series of desired linkages out into the bay to create public access along the shoreline. After the freeway was removed though, it became obvious that activities needed to be intense. If the meaning of what the ferry building had been as the gateway to the city had to create some way in which it can be activated. And this just showing uh, even before building plaza and modifying the edges of the, of the existing open space that's part of a redevelopment project, um, uh, the city staged major activities in the area to really help to bring people back to the waterfront. An important step is to recognize that it's not just the physical improvements that need to change, but ways in which you can activate them as well. Uh, many other, uh, a farmer's market began in the uh, parking lot in front of the ferry building. Uh, the idea of event staging, 
uh, and um, bicycle races on the Embarcadero. So trying to bring activities to, to the area as well was an important piece of the steps that needed to be taken. Ultimately, the ferry building itself was redeveloped and the market that was outside went into the building and on the open spaces around the ferry building. And there is a very attractive and successful market um, every weekend uh, on, uh, in this area. And then the inside of the building itself became the place for a lot of the permanent uh, stalls of the marketplace. But just to reinforce a point, the, the, the improvements that we designed for the plaza and the promenades and the parks in the area, all were implemented with the help of federal funds maybe five years before the ferry building was restored. So the ferry building, at the time we were making the building these very important improvements to create a connection, there was limited ferry service um, and ferry service was trying to re-establish itself, but it was fairly limited at the beginning and, and the ferry building was closed off, actually boarded up. So the physical improvements that themselves are not at all sufficient. We had transit and the beginning of the ferry, but, but the ferry building being open uh, was absolutely essential to the overall success of the area and the reconnection with the city. So ferry service was a part of the vision of what should happen in the area. Uh, and uh, a lot of it needed, we began with some simple improvements and then ultimately most recently uh, by constructing uh, three new uh, gates or six new berths uh, for ferry service south of the ferry building uh, in a completed project now uh, was uh, to be implemented. So really bringing back the ferry service to this area in a significant manner. In doing that, we also uh, created uh, a plaza area uh, for uh, uh, not only gatherings, but also for the ability to have staged large groups of people that would use the area to board the ferries. Now, one of the interesting things that happened during that period of time is that we had to address a whole number of new issues. And let's go to the next one, Bonnie, and then we can come back. One of the things that we had done when we were working on the early stages of the redevelopment of the area, we thought it was great that the ferry building was high enough to deal with sea level rise. By the time years had passed now, uh, we found that the sea level rise issues were sig significantly greater than even what the ferry building could do. And that the seawall, which Bonnie mentioned that was built uh, in the 1800s was also very seismically unstable. So the notion of having to design, and let's go back to the, uh, the facilities we had to raise them to meet the 100 year sea level rise projections because these are facilities that needed to be developed that would last for a significant period of time. So the steps that you see in the plaza and uh, the uh, raising of the grade in order to address sea level rise was an important function. We also had to now design all of this <clears throat> to be able to, uh, to uh, be sustain any seismic uh, change that might happen to the seawall and therefore it had to be designed with. So all of this is on very significant steel piles that were driven into the bay. And just to point out, uh, the seawall <laughs> is back here. The entire plaza is over water. So we had to, provide for the movement of the seawall so that if, if uh, the projection was several feet that, that the seawall would push in against our pile structure. We also had to design it in consideration, in consideration of mobilization uh, and emergency needs because 
the fairy rebirth really came to a great extent, at least legislatively, into existence After because the Bay Bridge, was the ba Bay Bridge would <laughs> collapse during Loma Prieta. And the only way or the most efficient way of getting from one side of the bay to the other was by ferry. Well, in addition to that, stormwater management became a new criteria that really needed to be considered because prior to that, all of the water just went right into the bay. So we had to develop a way in which we captured the rainwater and the runoff from the plaza into bioretention areas. Sorry, <laughs> losing my. Uh, so you know the all of these functional requirements, however, did not diminish the need to create an attractive and um, engaging place for the waterfront as a whole. <coughs> And really that concludes the slide presentation. <coughs> um, I think the thing that's interested, the interesting story about the San Francisco waterfront in many ways is that it, it was not a project, it's not a single thing, it's an unfolding series of events that continues to you know, reconceive itself as time goes on. It's, it's an extraordinary story, um, but it, it's, and it's something that we've been proud to be a part of, but it really takes the leadership of a city to continue on and to continue the path towards revitalization because it, it is a major effort and it involves a lot of people. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you so much. If there are any questions or comments, you know, we'd certainly respond. <coughs> uh, Mary Beth, are you, uh, have you had any, any questions sent to you? have not yet. I want to encourage everybody to use the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen and you can send in questions. And now it looks like now that I'm talking, one came through. Um, a comment from uh, Julio Cesar uh, Hernandez, um, just that it was an excellent lecture. Um, so if we have any questions from the audience, you can submit them now. I think uh, it if there are questions waiting to come in, I'll just point to this slide a little bit more and say that I think we talked about the importance of setting up a line of access all the way along the back when we were looking at the slides of the, of the, ferry, the bay side and of the ferry building and being able to walk all the way along here when we had previously designed an earlier ferry terminal here and then one on the north end uh, and we're uh, helping with the ferry building design criteria. I was saying that the under arcade areas were considered an important connection, but by the time we started this project, they had already been filled in. So we moved everything out somewhat to be able to provide for public access along the shoreline edge. You know, going back to a point, you know, this kind of large scale transformation do need a public-private approach to doing that. And, you know, there's been a resistance <coughs> since the redevelopment days for governmental involvement in um, the re redevelopment of areas. But um, in order to accomplish this, you cannot just uh, have the private sector do it. These kinds of large-scale transformations do require public funding, as well as private development and private activities to really be successful. And the role of the architect or, or landscape architect in, in pulling these things together is I think something that can't be underestimated because you know, it, this is not about strictly planning, but thinking visually and thinking three-dimensionally, which uh, is, is an incredible resource uh, for uh, cities and places. In our experience, we've worked, most of our projects began with the idea, an idea that a citizens group had come together to pursue that sounded great, but nobody had ever bothered to look at the three-dimensional implications of what that, that concept really were or how it would fit or spatially, what would it mean 
uh, and not only in, in a physical sense, but also in an activity sense. Uh, and this was an example of one of those uh, projects where when we started working on the plaza, the idea of the Citizens Advisory Committee already was that the best solution was to put the Embarcadero below grade and to uh, then build a complete pedestrian area above grade. However, uh, besides the points that Boris made about the BART tube com coming across, was the idea of what happens when you make a cut like that and how do you actually transition below grade? So nobody had really given those kinds of thoughts to it and nobody really had um, the interests across the board about how traffic would work uh, and how the whole city would fit together. But, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, the involvement that we had on this waterfront included economists, transportation consultants, engineers, and a whole variety of other dis disciplines as well. But one of the things I would say from the architect's point of view is that the kind of visual thinking creates a holistic approach to addressing these urban issues. And I think that that's an important thing to continue. You can bring in all of those different disciplines together, but you do need the kind of holistic thinking that can unify them and see what the uh, implications are on the aesthetic, on the livability, on those you know, qualities of a place. And therefore you really need to uh, uh, be part and lead the team in a lot of ways um, that redesigns uh, this portions of the city, larger portions of the city. When we introduced the idea, it was really uh, Boris who came forward with the, the notion because the city was already pursuing the idea of accommodating the Barcadero Freeway at grade. So providing for all of that traffic to occur on gra grade and, and Boris came to the city. It was kind of late in the process. I don't think we were, we were definitely not working on the project that we weren't consultants but came forward with the idea of looking at the grid of the city as a way of distributing the traffic. It had not been looked at and the, uh, the environmental impact report and the environmental impact statement were just about to be completed and certified. And the city uh, pulled back that process and reopened it up. However, uh, we, we did have to bring in transportation consultants to uh, stand behind us in that process because um, the thinking was that an architect really wouldn't wouldn't know enough about how uh, traffic would work and and to a certain extent they're right but there's a, an important need to understand well, it's, all it's of about the pieces. thinking out of the box that's really what it amounts to thinking out of the I box think, you know you all that are students uh, you know at Notre Dame uh, you know you will you know, having that visual thinking and being able to think out of the box is a very important ability. And knowing enough about all of the different disciplines that are coming together is also, I think, an extremely important part so that you can be able to, to help set the direction, but with an understanding of what that will mean and what that will take. I do have a, a couple of questions now. Um, one that sort of builds on what you're talking about now. Um, you talk a lot about the city as a, an entity, but what you really have to work with as well as the city as a, as a monolith is the individual politicians. And so the question is coming in, how difficult is it designing and working with the politicians, especially as long-term plans may not be carried from one administration to another? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very good question. And I think I would say a couple of things. No project in city building can be done at the end without good leadership. So we cannot, we're not gonna be able to work in isolation. Uh, having good leadership uh, is an important aspect. Uh, the second thing is, you know, today there is also a tendency to react to the ivory tower approach that had been taken early on sort of in the way in which cities should be designed. And I, you know, I'm talking about even going back as far as Le Corbusier, thinking of the ideal city and it should look like this. And then we brought in 
sort of community participation as a way of giving voice to uh, the user and to the community that would have to live there or is living there. And, and I think that that was a very important thought, but community participation has become to, in some ways uh, a way of uh, really just creating process rather than the end product. So I think we have to be careful as to how we put these elements together in order to make them work. I think in San Francisco, I mean, this could be a question where you could talk about politics as a whole and government as a whole, because there's been so much flip-flopping around the nation in terms of, uh, you know, what is the agenda and where we're going. But in, in San Francisco, in these early years, and for many years, we've had very strong shared values about what should happen on the waterfront. Uh, it, there weren't, at the time we started the project, um, but the city leadership put together this 32 member citizens advisory committee of people who really represented different points of view and really worked hard. They weren't, uh, later when we worked on the waterfront, when the ideas were to underground the freeway, it was an ad hoc group. It, some people came, some people didn't come. Um, individuals that had their own, uh, you know, ax to grind would do so at meetings and it would be very difficult to, to get consensus. But I think that the willingness to bring something to consensus within shared values about what the potential of a place can be is, is really uh, what makes success. We've worked on many, many projects where a change in the mayor has meant that the whole project has fallen apart. Um, in this case, we were very fortunate because despite all the differences that every single administration has, I think there's a shared commitment to improving the waterfront and the shoreline edge. So the next question is gonna come from one of our faculty members who actually is working herself with her students on a multi-year project focused on the Mumbai waterfront. And I think Professor Papali Crochet is gonna ask her question directly. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth. Uh, thank you very much for your excellent lecture this afternoon. Uh, I really enjoyed the holistic approach idea that you talked about, and that's something that we are looking into. One of the things I wanted to ask you a question about was the sea level rise and the indication of great change that you had to do uh, to accommodate a hundred year plan. Uh, the question would be, how much was the great change that you looked at? And also what approximately was uh, the overall cost for such a large level of infrastructure change for that grade? Um, well, let me start with the latter part. The construction of the six berths or three gates of the ferry terminal and the plaza and all that area was a fairly expensive proposition. You know, it's about $70 million that it took. But again, it was uh, funded to a great extent, uh, not only uh, because of the emergency requirements of ferry service, but also for, uh, you know, what's been happening in many cities is that we don't have peak times anymore. Congestion on roadways is all day long and the need for uh, additional transportation modes uh, was really required. So it's a fairly expensive, uh, you know, project from, you know, that standpoint. What, what, we, what we were able to do was to separate our, our project, the ferry terminals and the plaza from everything else along the shoreline. I think one of the things that would have made it extraordinarily difficult, way too costly, and ultimately led to abandonment of the project would have been had we had to really touch the great seawall itself. So we, we did not address that question. What happens to the great seawall that underlines this uh, curving arc of shoreline? Um, and uh, doing the work uh, over water also, I think, facilitated Bonnie, the ability to- Can you turn in. to the slide that shows the different levels of sea level rise? Because that's really maybe was flashed on too quickly, but that has the... <laughs> Let me see if I can... Um, You'll have to reshare. 
Oh, I'll have to reshare. Okay, so let me see if uh, I can just, do that. That I, might we, take I a could few answer, seconds. Uh, answer it more okay. easily by having that also. Just one second, and I think we can get there. But possible, oh, you know what? I don't think so. Wait, I might have, let me stop share and start over again. Um, there, isn't that can it? you see this? Um, this you can? No. You can't, okay. If, uh, if it's a concern, to just there. the numbers would. No, but I don't think they're oh, saying. Okay, anyway, that's all right. It, you know, it's three and a half to. Uh, feet of sea level rise that we were addressing. Okay, that's that's excellent. Thank you. And, and, uh, but, uh, in those cases, you know, there are different projections that occur, but we took the most conservative point of view. That is the highest sea level rise that could occur in the area, and and uh, had to build in about three and a half feet higher than what the ferry building itself. Now, one of the things- Three and a half feet higher than the ferry building, but six feet higher than the Embarcadero, wasn't it? I, I, Five and a half no. to six feet higher than the Embarcadero. Which is higher, yeah. Uh, but um, uh, there is still a very large question as to how we protect when you do historic preservation along the waterfront, you're dealing with sea level rise. There's still a lot of questions about how to protect those mm -hmm. existing structures because you can't always lift them all uh, in order to do that. So the idea of creating uh, uh, perimeter improvements like breakwaters and like uh, to uh, protect the building was something that will need to be considered because although what we're building new meets the sea level rise, what exists still doesn't and it needs to be protected further. And I don't, you couldn't, I'm sure nobody noticed it or would, it would be hard to see anyway, but in that one sea level rise uh, slide that we showed, there was one that showed inundation around the city and you've seen those kinds of slides for many different cities <laughs> across mm -hmm. the United States. But the, 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 what it showed was an island where our uh, ferry terminal plaza and project are with everything else uh, virtually inundated. Mm -hmm. that, that's a bigger question as to how you do it on the entire waterfront area. It's a bigger question that you'll have to address in Mumbai. I'm sure because, uh, you know, how, how are you going to do it? And there are a lot of different ideas from, you know, building uh, a seawall around that whole portion of the city um, and um, other, other methods as well. And um, I will follow up. Thank you so much for your response on this question. Okay. Welcome. Uh, we have one last question, uh, also from Julio Cesar Carras Fernandez, and then we'll move to Stefanos uh, for a final question. Um, so um, Julio Cesar asks that says that he fully agrees about the holistic approach and comments that you mentioned Halperin, and can you talk more about your work with him? Well, in this case, we uh, he had really he wasn't working on the project at that particular period of time. And um, we had to modify the edges. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think he had any objections to that. He certainly, I know that the artist who did the Valiant Court Fountain really did not want it touched. <laughs> so it remained as it really, as it was, but trying to create, remove the barrier of the edge with very little change to the remainder of the project uh, was the approach we had taken. The, the, the plaza that Larry Halpern had designed was built probably 15 years before we got involved in the waterfront. And it, it, it was really an exceptional project, but I think that he understood that the context had entirely changed. I, I mean, it was not to his detriment that everything was turning away. There was a very good reason why you were turning away from the waterfront, which was that you were right, the Embarked Era Freeway was sitting on top of you practically. So it, it made a lot of sense. And I, I, I think he understood that the basics of it stayed the same. Um, 
but uh, he had already completed his work. All right, that brings us to you, Stephanos, for a final question. I, I wanted to ask uh, about where this work has led you, because this work was done some years ago. Very important, very transformational for everyone nationwide. But in San Francisco, what was the continuation of the work in the body of the whole city? Not only your part of that work, but others. Whom did this inspire? And how has this affected the, the city? And how is it headed towards uh, affecting its future from this point on. Okay, um, I would say that, let me, we were fortunate that we were hired under no, numerous uh, projects uh, in the same area. So a lot of people say that actually in some ways it was great to have uh, the same consultants working on the project because it created more community. But you don't implement every single piece by yourself. And I think that fitting in with a lot of other efforts uh, is an important part of the continuity. And certainly when you're dealing with public-private partnerships, for example, the redesign of the ferry building itself to accommodate the market was done by others. While we were doing how do the public spaces meet the building and come up against it. Others were dealing with how do we transform the building itself and accommodate the activities within it. So uh, working together, I think we shared the value of what ultimately needed to occur. Um, I think that uh, for you know everyone, the completion of the South Beach area in particular really continued that whole eff effort southwards. And there have been many uh, people who've been involved in the effort of you know, continuing the growth of the city to the south uh, from the medical center. Now there's a very significant residential mixed use project that has been planned on the old parking lots of the uh, giants that's underway and being built and, and so on. So I don't know if I've answered it fully. I, you know, I think that uh, for us, uh, the ability to address the transformation of this piece of the waterfront has let, you know, helped us to address the issue in many other communities um, around the world and in the United States. And I think I would just add to that by saying that when we started working on the Northeastern waterfront, which was so long ago now, uh, you know, not only was the waterfront a neglected place, but it was a neglected place in the eyes of many architects and designers. I mean, I don't think it was considered an exciting place to work, a place that had potential or a place you could really influence and change. So when we started working there, of course, there was a, a quite a bit of competition from other people, but I would say more planners and urban designers. And as time has gone on, what we have seen in the various places that we've worked in, and I mentioned a few at the beginning of the, the talk, uh, what we have played is a role that is much more collaborative in terms of design firms that come after us or design firms that precede us. Uh, particularly on the waterfront, we've seen in many places starting to create a strong framework for what a place could become and then working with a number of uh, architects and landscape architects in realizing that vision. In, in your experience, uh, do cities need such a decisive catalytic project before people can open their eyes, both professionals and citizens, and demand more and expect more and generate more? I think that you don't have to see a project realized to get excited about it. And this is what I think Boris was referring to a little bit previously. If you have the capabilities to design and then show what can happen, it oftentimes is enough to excite a public. But in this, in, in the San Francisco waterfront, uh, there was a lot of enthusiasm about making the change. Once it actually did happen is when the changes started coming in. 
But I would say, Stephanos, I, I, I'm very, I personally am very excited about what Biden is trying to do with the infrastructure program that he's been talking about in recent days. And, and I think that we do need to uh, develop some strong approaches to major address to those aspects of infrastructure and climate change in cities in order to get the kind of newest creative thinking and excitement about what can happen in them. So my answer would be, I do think you need some large scale intervention and, and uh, in order to really bring it forward and demonstrate that change can occur and change happens even more rapidly these days than ever before. And I think that uh, the only thing I would say is that you do need this kind of public intervention and support for it. You can't expect that it just happens uh, through the private sector in order to realize uh, these larger scale urban uh, transformations. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, Mayor Beth? Did have one more come through. Can you say something about how you interacted with the development of Mission Bay by the University of California? Oh, we didn't do that project. That was just a catalyst that came, you know, once, okay, in the case, and this re is related to Stefano's uh, question too. Once it was demonstrated that you could take an area like South Beach that was previously warehousing and uh, trucking areas and so on, and, and transform it significantly uh, with residential development and show how the infrastructure could be expanded. The idea of taking that further and, and uh, extending it further south and with good leadership from uh, the city at that time to uh, you know, encourage UC San Francisco to locate there uh, they really, uh, you know, demonstrated that that could happen. And, and uh, we weren't involved in it, but we just showed that the catalyst of ha having helped to implement South Beach and all of that area along the waterfront really led to a whole number of new projects all the way uh, in the Southern waterfront as well that were undertaken by other uh, uh, property owners, other um, uh, architects and urban designers and by institutions uh, as well. Thank you. It looks like we're going to end right on time. Richard, do you want to say a few parting words? No, oh, that was a wonderful lecture. Thank you so much. I, I almost want to end by asking if you might come to uh, uh, to South Bend and work on our riverfront here. <laughs> it's about as long, so uh, that would be so great. We are, we are starting a project in the school to look after the riverfront, so that's sure. not a very far question. Indeed. Well, Indeed. I, I should say that our, our interest in the San Francisco waterfront came when we were in Miami and we were working on the Miami riverfront and we were so inspired by what could happen along rivers and water bodies that we took a long trip around the world to look at different waterfronts and then the San Francisco waterfront, the place that we were from, uh, the city decided to move ahead with that project. So rivers are of great interest to us as well. But I think that at this point you have a lot of really good talent yeah. there that can can undertake yeah, the project. Yeah, it'll be interesting and, to see what and, your students come but up But we would be glad to, you know, add any, you know, thoughts to the process. But I, I don't think we're in that, you know, we're <laughs> semi-retired <laughs> at this point. Your, your, oh, your work is very, us. very inspiring. So. Retirement's not allowed, so we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're cool. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Very soon.